Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you here this morning. I'm Chris Lee. I'm one of the worship leaders here, and um, we are glad that you are here with us this morning. We have, like, every children's choir and bell thing basically happening upstairs, um, and so uh, some, of, uh, some of our families who uh, have small ones are up there worshiping this morning, but it looks like we have a few little ones who are still going to be holding up the wall um, with their ribbons. Um, we are glad that you're here. Um, make yourself at home if you're with us for the first time or it's or the first time in a long time. We are glad that you're here. Um, make yourself at home. Why don't you stand as we begin to worship this morning through song? Good morning. Oh, hey. I'm getting a phone call. <laughs>
Uh, well, we're going to. Uh, why don't you Why don't you have a seat? Sorry, I'm just getting ahead of getting ahead of myself. Um, well, we're glad you're here. Those who, um, who who came in after my initial welcome, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Um, if you did not get a bulletin um, this morning, if you want to just raise your hand where you are, we will get you a bulletin. You will want one today. There is a lot of stuff coming up this week. Uh, today is uh, typically referred to as Palm Sunday or Passion Sunday. It's the Sunday before Easter that uh, begins Holy Week. And um, that's where we are. That's where we are today. And so uh, what we celebrate and what we remember this coming week uh, is a lot of things in the story of Jesus. Um, and that means that we are doing a lot of different things this week and a lot of uh, different worship opportunities. Every uh, on Monday through Thursday, we will have noonday services all four of those days. Um, if you have been coming to the Wednesdays throughout Lent, this week we will be doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday noonday services. So come be a part of those uh, during your lunch break or, or whatever. Um, and then Thursday night upstairs in the sanctuary, we will have our Maundy Thursday service um, that you will not want to miss. It's always a really beautiful time of worship. And then on Friday, our Good Friday service will be down here in this space. Um, and some of us will be uh, helping lead that service. And, um, and so come and be a part of that uh, as we get into our dark weekend um, leading to Easter. Um, and Easter, we have a lot of opportunities to worship. Um, and you can see those in your bulletin as well. Um, that morning, uh, we will be celebrating the risen Christ. Uh, so make plans to come worship with us and invite your friends, your neighbors, um, people that you know who might be looking for a place to worship. Um, invite them to come celebrate with us this Sunday. If there's any day of the year to come and worship and celebrate together, it's next Sunday, um, the biggest Sunday of the Christian calendar. Um, when we celebrate the risen Lord. So uh, make plans to be with us this week in uh, ways that we, uh, opportunities that we have to worship that are atypical. Um, as we also always have Celebrate Recovery on Wednesday, we'll be doing some different things this Wednesday, so come be a part of that. If you have not checked out Celebrate Recovery before, come this week. Um, and uh, we also uh, have opportunities to be in service every week. So if you need a place to, um, to serve, please talk to Sarah or me after the service. We will find a way um, to get you plugged in in that way. Okay, there are a lot of things going on. I know that was a full list, uh, but this is an important week um, for us to continue to be together, to celebrate together, and to worship together. Um, so uh, come be a part of these things uh, that we're doing this week. Let's uh, continue worship by going to God in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this day and for this chance to get to be here in this place to give you our worship and our praise because you alone are worthy. This week is such a huge week. We, we remember your, um, your entry into the city um, in celebration and people uh, crying out to you with excitement. And um, we know that the week ended differently um, as, we, as we get closer to Friday to the weekend. We know that there was some darkness, but uh, the darkness is cast away by the light that you bring on Resurrection Sunday. And we're so thankful for um, how you um, rose to new life so that we too could rise to new life every single day. May we follow where you lead in these new lives that you're calling us to each and every day. And as we give you our worship and our praise this morning, may you be honored and glorified by the worship that we give to you. If it's in Christ's holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, why don't you stand and greet your neighbor and find out who you're worshiping with this morning.
Well, we uh, taught you a new song last week if you were here. Uh, we're going to sing it again now, so why don't you join us? You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You stood before my failure, my soul now to stand. You stood
righteous gain I count but loss in poor contempt on all my pride see from his hands his hands his feet sorrow and love flow me go down is such love in sorrow me y'all we're gonna do one more why don't y'all have a seat um so sarah and i were talking this week as we were preparing for um this service um and 
We're just talking about what the cross means to us. Um, and one of the things that Sarah shared is, is uh, about how Jesus being on the cross, feeling abandoned there to die, um, knows exactly how we feel when we also feel abandoned, when we feel alone. Um, and so that's why we wanted to um, spend some time worshiping with this song as we declare and realize even maybe just in this moment that we are not by ourselves. We are never alone. Um, Jesus knows us, knows what we are going through, whether you've shared it with someone else or not. Um, even when you feel like maybe everyone else in your life has abandoned you, God never will. God promises to never leave us nor forsake us. Um, so let's be in that, in that uh, prayerful state um, as we sing this song.
to get the hanky out already. (laughs) (laughs) Dear friends, before we um, enter into our time of prayer together this morning, I do want to, I know Chris shared with you about our noonday services, but I want to highlight one in particular. On Friday, Friday is going to be a little different. Um, For Good Friday, instead of having our normal noon worship service and then meal at 1230, we're we're not doing that. But you will have an opportunity to be in prayer that day um, uh, using the Stations of the Cross. This is sort of a way to walk through um, the last 24 hours of Jesus' life with an image uh, and then um, some scripture reading and some prayer. Uh, We will have those set up in Wesley Hall, which is the upstairs fellowship hall, uh, from uh, 9 until about 6 on Friday. And so you can come anytime during the day. If you still have lunchtime uh, break, come then. If you want to come after work, come then. If you're an uh, early person, you're out and you're about at 9 o'clock, come then. But you will enter Wesley Hall. You'll get a a booklet that um, sort of leads you through those stations. And then um, they're numbered 1 through 12. So you just kind of go through and spend as much time or as little time at each place. Um, as your spirit needs. But, um, but that is a little different from what we've been doing, um, but it will be a, a time to extend our prayers um, as we um, share in Good Friday, and then we will be in this place, in this space, uh, Friday evening for that service. So I invite you to, to think about ways that you can work that into your schedule on Friday. And now, friends, let us go to our God in prayer. Almighty and gracious God, we are not alone. You do go with us. You go before us and beside us and behind us. No matter what we go through, you are there. Even when we don't recognize it, you are there. Especially when we don't feel it, you are there. God, this world, this world needs Easter so desperately again. We need to feel the joy and the celebration of the resurrected King. But we are not there yet. We are here on this Palm Passion Sunday, ready to enter into a week where again we hear the stories of that last week of Jesus, that last 24 hours of Jesus, the last breath of Jesus. And as we settle into this week, knowing that there is still school and work and chores to do, may we feel your presence as you walk us through this trying moment. So that when we come to the cross on Friday, we will know that we are not alone. And when we return back to this place on Sunday, we will be so filled with joy and your Holy Spirit that we will not be able to contain ourselves in our worship, in our presence, in our faces. So gracious God, guide us as you lead us to the cross this week. We are not alone. You are always with us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward as we share together in our morning offering. And as they do, after you've had a chance to share a bit of the blessing that God has given to you, I'm going to invite you to take the um, attendance registries that are on the inside aisle um, and fill those out. If there's any new information you want us to have, new new email, new phone number, that kind of thing, um, or anything else you might want to share with us. If you are visiting with us today, um, we would love to know, um, to be able to, to send you some information about our church um, and to offer you a bit of fresh bread tomorrow. Um, And so uh, please take a moment to fill those out as we share together in our morning offering.
To the sinners, ears it may sound strange. The freedom could be found through death and pain. Why sinless perfection took the blame? But hallelujah. For our part in it would take the cross. Salvation paid for at the highest cost. Our salvation gained in heaven's loss. Oh, hallelujah. One can wash away my sin. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. There is nothing strong enough to sin. Guess what love has done without stretched hands? For now salvation flows for everyone. kids who would like to go to kids and worship, uh, Mr. Nathan is going to uh, take the kids at this time, if there are any who would like to go. Thanks. 
Well, friends, we, um, during this season of Lent, have looked at um, these last days of Jesus' earthly life. We started a few days before Palm Sunday with the story of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Um, and then we kind of skipped over Palm Sunday, which is, is today, traditionally. Today is the day that um, the crowd sang Hosanna and waved palm branches and threw their cloaks in the road. And um, Jesus entered triumphantly into Jerusalem. That sort of happened that first week of Lent for us because we immediately went to um, Jesus and his disciples in the upper room. In John's gospel, we hear, um, and we don't hear this in any other gospel, but in John's gospel, we hear about the moment where Jesus puts a towel around his waist and washes his disciples' feet, something that no Jew would do for another Jew. Usually a servant from another country had to do that. Even the Jewish servants wouldn't lower themselves to wash the dirt from someone's feet. And yet Jesus does this. In that moment, Peter is the one who says, no, you can't wash my feet. And then eventually through talking with Jesus, Peter finally says, then wash all of me. And then right after that, we hear about Peter denying Jesus, saying, I, I don't even know who he is. Just hours after he said lord wash wash all of me three times peter says i don't i don't know him and then we move to um the court scene between P uh, jesus and pilate and we stayed there for two weeks listening to who who the people say that jesus is who pilate says that jesus is and then Pilate trying as many times as he could, John tells us, five or six times, trying to, to um, release Jesus, but the people wouldn't have it. And so to satisfy the crowd, Pilate turns Jesus over to be crucified. In John's gospel, um, the crucifixion... Um, is many verses. Um, it starts at 16b and um, goes through um, verse 30. And we're going to read selections of those today. So uh, you will not be able to follow along on the screen because I'm going to kind of skip some things just to be a little more concise. But if you want all of John's story, uh, you can look in your Bibles. John chapter 19, beginning, the whole chapter 19 um, begins with that um, uh, Pilate and Jesus, uh, Pilate trying to to release Jesus. But then starting at 16b is where the crucifixion story is. So I invite you to read that, the whole thing, later today. So this is from John's Gospel, chapter 19. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. And after this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, In order to fulfill scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God, and because of it, we can give thanks to our God. On my door at home is still a heart wreath from February. 
Um, I love the wreaths with the cute little Easter eggs on them and, and the beautiful bright colors of Easter, but my liturgical self cannot put Easter eggs up on the door until after Easter. And then I sort of feel like, well, Easter's over with. We do have 50 days of Easter, but the Easter egg part is over with, and so I just sort of skip that <laughs> and try to find some beautiful flowers or something, you know, to stick on there. But I can't put happy colors up <laughs> during Lent. I can't put Easter eggs up before Easter. And so I always struggle with what goes on the front door after Valentine's Day. And in my list of things to do around the house that I keep on my phone, that um, it's embarrassing to tell you how, 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 um, how long that list has been on my phone. How about that? <laughs> um, uh, it, it has said, at least for the last two weeks, I've added, change the wreath still there you can drive by if you go that way home you see it it's still there the heart wreath is still is still there but you know what I realized yesterday that the heart belongs on my door at least until Easter Monday because this week holy week is about love when we look at John's gospel John uh, tells us at least seven, seven different ideas about the significance of Jesus' death. He uses a, a lot of metaphors, including at least five different Old Testament allusions pointing toward the different meanings of Jesus' death. In John's Gospel, Jesus' death is an atoning sacrifice to save us from sin. He's the one who goes before us so that we are saved from sin. It's a, a substitutionary sacrifice to save us from death. Jesus died to death and now, now we don't have to because when we die we will have new life in God. Jesus died as a, a demonstration of God's love for humanity, a model that Christians are meant to look to in practicing sacrificial love. John says that Jesus died as a, um, a portrait is in, of Jesus is intended to stir the hearts of thousands more that will come and follow him. Jesus' death is a, a sign for John of God's ultimate triumph over death, a dramatic reversal of the events of Eden, following the disobedience of Adam and Eve in the garden. When John talks about the cross of Jesus, he is using all of these ideas for the reason why Jesus died. As Chris uh, shared a bit with you earlier, one of the things that I always think of now, when I think of the cross, comes from um, a, a, a 20th century or 21st century um, theologian who is still alive today, Jürgen Moltmann. He's a German theologian. I had, had an entire class in seminary just on the writings of Jürgen Moltmann. And one of the books that he wrote was called The Crucified God. And it really helped me to understand what was happening in the moment of the cross, why Jesus died. And one of the things that Moltmann says is in that moment of the cross, when Jesus is feeling that utter agony and torment and abandonment and pain and anguish, that God is feeling those things too. Because God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one together. And so in the moment of the cross, when Jesus feels abandoned, God knows what it feels like to be abandoned. And when Jesus is feeling tortured and tormented, God knows what it feels like to be tortured and tormented. And so when we have those moments in our lives where we feel abandoned and tortured and tormented and in anguish and despair... God is not some far off deity that has no idea what we've been through. Because in the moment of the cross, God has already been there. God has felt the torment that we feel. God has felt the anguish and the abandonment and the uncertainty. And God has been on the brink of death. Right where we are. And when I think about a God who would go to this most torturous instrument of the cross, 
the cross where people are stripped naked, where nails are hammered into their hands and their feet, where really we think of the cross as somewhere high up in the air. It's a distance from me to you. I can see your eyes. You can see mine. You can hear my voice. Even without the speakers, you could hear my voice right now. I could hear yours if you yelled insults at me and I could feel the spit when you were so angry. The God who would do that, who would endure that kind of suffering, the suffering that takes your breath away, literally, they would um, have to lift themselves up by the nails in their hands and push against the nails in their feet in order to breathe. The God who would do that would only do that because of love. You would not allow yourself to be tortured, to come to that moment of utter despair and humiliation if it weren't for love. In his book, The Final Words, Adam Hamilton writes this of Jesus and the cross. He said, through his death, Jesus reveals our sinfulness, the costliness of grace, and the magnitude of God's mercy. On the cross, Jesus shows us what love looks like. In his death, he identifies with our pain, our suffering, our human mortality. And in his resurrection, he proves that he has overcome each of these. Hamilton says Jesus was doing all of this on the cross to redeem, to save, and to draw humanity to himself. And this is what the it that was finished as Jesus shouted his dying words. This morning's text, Jesus says it is finished. It is not a defeated finished but he is saying here in this moment, what he came to do is accomplished. I've said this multiple times to people who have um, been in this service um, uh, regularly, but um, one of the things that, you know, now that we have Facebook, you always gotta post something fun on Christmas and Easter, something theologically profound, right? And the thing that I post every Christmas is, love came down at Christmas. It's a line from a hymn that we would sing. Love came down at Christmas. And you know what the line is that I put on Easter Sunday? Love's redeeming work is done. What Jesus finished on the cross was showing the world the extent of God's love, showing the world the extent of God's grace, showing the world that God knows when we are in the pit of despair. That God knows how it feels when we cannot catch our breath. That God knows how it feels when we feel abandoned and alone. Love's redeeming work is done. We always sing that on Easter Sunday, but I think it's for today. Because Jesus says, it is finished. That's the Good Friday song now. Love's redeeming work is done. Love's work, love that came down at Christmas, is finished on the cross. The bonus <laughs> comes for us on Easter. Something astounding and amazing is finished as Jesus died here on the cross. It is a masterpiece of love and redemption for us and for the world. As Jesus says, it is finished. May we know that love's work is done. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, 
in those moments on the cross where Jesus feels hurt when he can't breathe when he cries out to you my God, my God, why? You know how we feel in those moments when we feel abandoned, when we are tortured, when we cannot catch our breath. And yet Jesus also knows when the work that he was sent to this world to do, to share love and to show grace, to offer forgiveness and mercy, and to bring about peace. John says, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he asked for something to drink. And then he said, it is finished, it is accomplished. Love's redeeming work is done. And so, gracious God, as we are in this holy week, help us to look to the love. When we see hearts and the word love just written around in the world, may we remember in that moment that this week is about love. And when we come to Good Friday and we read and hear once again about the torture and the death of our King Jesus, may we hear these words, it is finished not as a cry of defeat, but as a shout of victory. For love's redeeming work is done. And as we enter into Saturday and then come again on Sunday, may we be so filled with your love that it spills over and out into this world. In the name of your love made flesh, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, I um, asked Chris to do um, How Deep the Father's Love for Us again this week. We, um, we shared it last week. But this um, song goes through some of those last words of Jesus, these last moments, but it also reminds us of why we have the cross. Not because our God died, but because our God loves us so much. God was willing to endure the suffering of the cross so that we could connect to God in a way that the people before Jesus never were able to. And so as you feel led, you may stand as we sing together. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turned His face away His wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulder. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice. Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished
I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection What should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer but this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom. And now, friends, go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion with the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forevermore.